Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm your host, Lakshmi Santosh, filling in for our chair, Dr. Walker, while he's traveling. It is my great delight to introduce to our new speaker today, who is here as a visiting professorship in a very special session. So this talk is actually jointly sponsored by the UCSF divisions of endocrinology and metabolism, as well as UCSF nephrology in the Department of Medicine. It's my great honor to introduce Dr. Joseph Verbalis. He graduated initially from Princeton University in chemistry, which probably explains his beloved obsession with the electrolytes that we're going to discuss today. Then he went on to the University of Pittsburgh for his medical degree, completed residency training at the University of Pennsylvania, and then fellowship training as well back at the University of Pittsburgh. He then quickly rose to a tenured professor of medicine and then relocated to Georgetown University, where he currently practices as the chief of the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism. He is a continuously funded NIH grant funded researcher for over 25 years and is truly a world expert in disorders of acid base, stas- uh, acid base status, homeostasis, hyponatremia. And he's here to discuss a topic that's near and dear to all of our hearts in the Department of Medicine, an important topic, challenges in the management of hyponatremia. As always, this is a special hybrid session, but we can find us on Zoom where there's closed captioning available. And of course, at the end, stay on for CME credit, whether you're in person or by Zoom. I'm now going to turn it over briefly to Dr. Sunil Kolawat, the division chief of the UCSF Endocrinology and Metabolism, for a brief introductory remarks on this special lecture. Thank you so much to both of you. Thanks, Lakshmi. I uh, really appreciate uh, uh, everybody joining in this brief Uh, prelude is for the trainees who may be attending both in person as well as remotely. So this is kind of the way in the hospital we think of our patients who have problems with with sodium. And, you know, it's basically a function of there being a box. And we, we look at the sodium that we see and we ask whether that sodium is in the box. And if it's not, the goal is to get it in the box. And there are complicating factors that get in the way of us doing that. First and foremost being that we need to get the patient finished with their length of stay out of the hospital in good stead, doing well as quickly as we possibly can and as efficiently as we possibly can. So there's a time element. There's complexity because there are multiple factors, especially nowadays with our our complex patients in hospitals nationwide that are impinging on what is putting the sodium outside the box. And so we have to deal with that complexity. And finally, there are services who may tell us, quote, we'd like the sodium to be running a little bit high on this patient, or quote, that patient tends to run a low sodium. And that lore and those other uh, uh, intervening factors also impact on our analysis of why the sodium is outside the box and what we need to do to get it inside the box. So as a PhD scientist coming out of training back into medical school, I saw this this phenomena in my hospital um, as a trainee. And it perplexed me because to me, sodium represented a marker of a process, a marker of homeostasis, balance, equilibrium, not unlike body weight or temperature or calcium or a whole host of other numerical indicators of processes that are balanced through evolutionary uh, mechanisms with redundancies to maintain tight control over a very, very important phenomenon but that's not the way we talked about it in the hospital. And so I thought to myself, perhaps the relationship between clinical medicine and the basic science underlying it was more discontinuous than I had thought it might be when I was in the lab. But, and I will recommend these two articles to you. um, uh, If any of you um, uh, in training have not read these two, they're beautiful. Um, I was inspired by reading these two articles that appeared back to back um, weeks in um, the New England Journal in May of 2000, towards the end of my intern year. And um, they're beautiful because they're well-written. They're beautiful beautiful because uh, the explanations are simple and they're beautiful because they connect back to the basic science that you thought you you, you could forget and wondered what you were gonna do with and, and elegantly explain these two processes in the context of that basic science. And that is why it's so wonderful that we have uh, Joe Verbalis here today, because he is one of these individuals who really brings that basic science to light in clinical teaching and in the context of patient care. I was lucky enough because in June, my final year of internship, I got to rotate at Baylor College of Medicine with Horacio Adrigue, who is um, uh, the author of, uh, of both of these articles, along with Matias. And um, it was wonderful 
brought so many things to light and it changed my view. There are people in academic medicine who still think conceptually about things and having that feeling really is inspiring as you yourself are considering a, a career in academia. And Joe, I think, you know, you really, um, uh, uh, to me anyways, embody this principle. And that's why you've been a leader in this area of saltwater um, homeostasis and, and um, uh, uh, sodium disorders for so many years. And so thank you again for joining us. And we really appreciate your remarks. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, it's a really uh, an honor and a privilege uh, uh, and great joy to be here with you uh, at UCSF uh, because UCSF is clearly one of the premier academic health care centers in the U.S. Uh, and so I appreciate the invitation by both endocrinology and nephrology uh, to spend time with you, get to know you, uh, get, have you get to know me uh, and uh, uh, what I think about uh, what Sunil has described as um, the underlying pathophysiology of fluid electrolyte disorders and how that should influence our management. So, you know, I could give this talk as a medical student talk, just giving you nuts and bolts of how do you manage hyponatremia. That would be boring. Uh, and so I'm not going to do that. What I will talk about today is that after 43 years uh, as a faculty member, yes, it's that long. I just added it up. Um, you know, I've, I've observed and been done research in hyponatremia during that period, and, and I've come to conclusions about what really are some of the major challenges that you all as physicians face in treating this disorder, because there still is controversy uh, about a lot of things in this field. So what I'm going to do today is give you my personal view of the, of the challenges I think are uh, uh, still present in this field, uh, and uh, the best evidence-based data on on how to address them and, and how to treat these patients. Uh, I have consulted for, for Atsuka in the past, which makes Tobaptin an ABP receptor antagonist, um, not in recent years, but I figured I should list that. So before we start on the challenges, why is it that you should be concerned about hyponatremia? I'll show you two epidemiological studies that should convince you that this is something you should be concerned about. First one uh, is from uh, the group of Nick Medias that uh, Sunil uh, showed you two articles from. Uh, and, it, and it summarizes uh, EHR analysis of 53,000 patients uh, uh, over a seven year period of time, looking at the relation between inpatient mortality uh, shown on the, um, this, oh, there it is, shown on the Y axis and the admission sodium. And as we see in medicine so often, it's a U shaped curve. Uh, it goes up when sodium is high because these patients are dehydrated, but it also goes up when patients are low, increased mortality. And you can say what's new, we knew about that for several decades. What's new is with the use of this kind of big data and big data sets, we can see this relation with greater granularity than we ever could in the past. So yes, most people would acknowledge mortality goes up when sodium is less than 125. But in these patients in Boston, it didn't start there. Mortality started increasing when they were less than 130. In fact, it started increasing in that range from 130 to 135 for where most everyone in medicine regards this as a asymptomatic hyponatremia, which is a number that's not necessary to treat, but mortality did go up in that range, at least in this study. And if 53,000 records isn't enough to convince you let me show you this study from Denmark of almost 300,000 patients, because in Denmark, they have a national registry. So they know every patient that's in the hospital and they know all the parameters uh, that, are, that are there. And they looked in this group at uh, both 30 day and one year mortality. Uh, the bottom line are the patients that are normonatremic. The upper lines are patients that are hyponatremic. They divided them by level of hyponatremia. I just want to call your attention to this line in the middle with the long dashed line. And if you look at the legend, those are patients with sodiums between 130 and 134.9. This is mild asymptomatic hyponatremia, yet in 300,000 patient admissions, it also was associated increased mortality. Now remember that uh, epidemiological data tells you associations. It doesn't prove causal effect. So I'm not telling you today that low sodiums, even in that uh, very low uh, range are the cause of increased mortality. I'm telling you they are a marker of increased mortality uh, 
and you should pay attention to it. There is something going on with those patients just causing the increased mortality. It may be an underlying disease. It may be early CHF, maybe an occult tumor, but you shouldn't ignore it. You should evaluate it to see if you can find out what the cause is uh, of hyponatremia, even when it's mild in the patients that you see. So with that preface, and it was a preface, uh, these are the challenges I'll describe. They range from evaluation of hyponatremia to treatment of hyponatremia, and at the very end, so to some futuristic discussion of long-term adverse effects and future indications to treat hyponatremia. So rather than describe them now, uh, we'll just go through them one by one. So the biggest challenge that you face in evaluating hyponatremic patients is to differentiate uh, hypovolemic hyponatremia from euvolemic hyponatremia. And the reason this is important is illustrated in this uh, simplistic uh, uh, reductionist uh, cartoon. Um, you know, an endocrinologist uh, basically likes to simplify things. We like to make things simple so residents, fellows can really understand it. So, you know, there's hypothyroidism and there's hyperthyroidism, you know, that's, that's, that's it. And of course, there are multiple causes, but that's how you classify patients. So with hyponatremia, if the patient is a, uh, considered a beaker, that's two-thirds spool, that's body water, divided between intracellular, shown by potassium, extracellular by sodium, uh, fluid of choice coming into the system. The kidney is a smart spigot, just a spigot, but you know, I, I to, you know, to the benefit of nephrologists, it's a smart, a very smart spigot. It lets fluid out, and that's what keeps you in balance. If in that reductionist uh, uh, sense, you can only get hyponatremic two ways. One is by excess loss of solute. It can be through the kidney as naturesis. It can be through the skin as sweat, through the GI tract as diarrhea and and, and vomiting. Uh, but basically you have too little solute in the body. It can be mostly sodium, but it can be potassium too. We call that a depletional, I call it a depletional hyponatremia. Uh, the other way you can get hyponatremia is by dilution. In this case, the spigot is turned too tight. Water is retained. It builds up in the body shown by the yellow bar. That then dilutes the sodium in the extracellular space and the potassium in the intracellular space. That's a dilutional hyponatremia. If you think about these two types of hyponatremia, they are treated totally uh, uh, differently. With solute depletion, your goal is to replete the solute and usually to replete the volume because when you lose solute, you lose volume as well. They're hypovolemic and you all know the treatment is isotonic saline. This is diuretic induced hyponatremia. This is also an endocrinology Addison's disease from glucocorticoid deficiency. So it's fairly straightforward how you treat these patients. However, these patients will not respond to isotonic saline. They have enough solute, they have too much water. So our treatments have to be targeted to getting rid of the excess water. These patients need more fluid, these patients need less fluid. Treatment is diametrically opposed. If you don't make the correct initial diagnosis, you are destined to treat them uh, in the wrong way because treatment uh, is different for both groups. So how do you make that uh, determination? Of course, you do a clinical exam. We always depend on the clinical exam. The clinical exam is not good at picking up very mild degrees of volume depletion. It never has been. Uh, only severe degrees uh, can we reliably pick up. But if you look at the spot urine sodium, uh, that is a good differentiator of patients who have a normal effective arterial blood volume, as opposed to those who don't, who are dehydrated. In this uh, study from, uh, from Germany back in 2008, if the patient is not on diuretics, uh, use of a single spot urine sodium has a 97% accuracy of predicting whether the patient is euvolemic or hypovolemic. The cutoff they use is the one I recommend, 30 millimoles per liter. Under 30 millimoles per liter, you should think the patient is hypovolemic. Over 30 millimoles per liter, uh, you should think they're euvolemic. Somewhat arbitrary, there's a gray zone uh, around that 30, uh, but it's a reliable marker. So that wasn't actually the first study that showed this. You know, I'm a great believer in going back as far as you can in the old literature to see what was known before what we know today. And this study by Bob Schreier's group in nephrology at University of Colorado from 1987 really showed the same thing uh, in a different manner. So uh, Bob and his group took 100 consecutive patients with hyponatremia. Uh, they had 
uh, a physical exam by clinicians who were, I would argue, uh, some of the best nephrologists in the country at the time. Uh, and then regardless of their cl clinical exam, their physical exam, they treated them all the same. They treated them all with isotonic saline. Uh, and some people responded by increasing their serum sodium. We would consider those people that have been hypovolemic. And some people didn't respond, their serum sodium stayed the same. We would consider those patients to have the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuresis. And then they looked at what was the predictor of who responded and who didn't. And the good news is the, 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 the nephrologist's physical exam was right 50% of the time. The bad news is that the physical exam was right 50% of the time, which means it was like a coin toss. Uh, better than that was the urine spot of sodium shown here. And you can see the clear separation between the responders, the, the responders who had a low urine sodium and the non-responders who had an elevated serum sodium. Of course, there's some overlap. There's always overlap in these measures. But if you take a cutoff somewhere in the middle of around 30, uh, that is uh, a, a predictor of whether they're going to respond to saline or not. Uh, uh, in the majority of patients, greater than 90%. And therefore you can use that as a cutoff to determine who's eubulimic and who's hypovolemic. And that's why every patient presenting with hyponatremia should not just have the standard uosm, piosm, uh, uh, plasma sodium, but also urine electrolytes and specifically a spot urine sodium. Nephrologists of course would do a fractional excretion of sodium, but the data I showed you just said, it's, it's okay, but it's not necessary. In fact, the spot urine sodium is a little bit better predictive. So you can determine initially whether the patient's hypo or eubulimic, if you have a spot urine sodium before too much therapy is administered and, and, and you follow that. My, my residents and fellows know if the spot urine sodium is less than 30, the patient gets isotonic saline. If it's greater than 30, they get therapies uh, aimed at reducing total body water. Why does that work? It works because the kidney is in a better position to sense the uh, uh, body water and plasma volume of the patient than you are. And if the kidney, kidney senses, the senses is being underperfused, mechanisms to conserve sodium will be turned on, uh, spot urine sodium below. The kidney thinks it's being well perfused, there's no reason to save sodium. Uh, patient's not volume depleted, and so the urine sodium will be high. And I would advise you all, trust the patient's kidney. So second challenge is to make sure that uh, um, you make a correct diagnosis of a syndrome of inappropriate antidiuresis. You know, we're changing terminology uh, quite a bit in fields today. Um, you will all recognize this as SIADH. Uh, currently, we prefer to call it SIAD or the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuresis uh, for reasons that I'll show you in a, in a subsequent slide. These are the criteria. They were formulated in 1967 by Schwartz and Barter. Uh, that's over 50 years ago, and we still use them today. And you should think that criteria that have remained valid uh, and proven by clinical practice over 50 years, they're probably pretty good because they've withstood the test of time. Uh, so I would encourage you to make sure that before you make a diagnosis of SID, your patient meets these criteria, including number four, absent sodium conservation, as I've told you, urine sodium uh, greater than 30, but also rule out thyroid adrenal and renal disease. Now, that being said, that we should all follow these criteria, how often are they actually used in clinical practice? You know, it's one thing to say we should be doing this, and then it's another thing to say, are we really doing that? So we did a registry of hyponatremic patients in the US and the EU, about uh, 300 medical centers. This shows you the data on uh, patients that had a clinical diagnosis of SIAD. This is a retrospective chart review, but there was a clinical diagnosis of SIAD causing the hyponatremia in these patients. And then we simply looked at the medical record to see how often these tests were done. Uh, so. In fact, there were no differences between uh, US and EU. We, we were both equally bad. So I'll just look at all SIDH, 175, had no test performed at all. Uh, only 47% had the combination of serum osmolality, urine osmolality, and urine sodium done, much less for cortisol TSH. And only 21% patients, one out of five, really had all the short sparter criteria documented in the chart. Only one out of five. Uh, so yes, we know what the criteria are. Yes, we recommend you use them, but no, 
They're not being used uniformly uh, in both the US and the EU. So I would encourage you to, to alter this table uh, and make sure that you are measuring them appropriately. Now, one thing that's not in the criteria, you know, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion or SIAD has elevated levels of the antidiuretic hormone vasopressin that are inappropriate for the plasma sodium. Every patient, every orange dot here is a patient that, um, that has SIAD by, by the schwartz uh, criteria. And you can see that their AVP levels shown on the y-axis are not high, but they are inappropriate for a low plasma. Remember, this is not the syndrome of, of high AVP inappropriately, it's an inappropriate AVP. Yes, a few are very high shown at the top, but most are in the normal range, but they should be suppressed. The reason that AVP is not a criteria, AVP level is not a criteria for diagnosis of SID, it will not differentiate an elevated AVP due to the serum of inappropriate antidiuresis from hypovolemia. Because when you're hypovolemic, the low blood pressure, low blood volume will also stimulate AVP secretion. So it has no differential diagnostic value, which is why you don't need to measure it in your evaluation of patients with uh, hyponatremia and SIAD. It's always been the case that there are some patients that meet all criteria with lower unmeasurable AVP. We don't really understand that group. Uh, yet, even now, uh, which is why we prefer to say syndrome of inappropriate antidiuresis rather than syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion, since about 10% patients will not have measurable elevated uh, AVP levels. And these days we're going over to uh, not measuring AVP because it's difficult, but measuring part of the AVP prohormone called copeptin, which is more stable in plasma, easier to assay. Uh, and so that's also been looked at in the differential diagnosis of hyponatremia. And as you would expect, if AVP can't differentiate hypovolemia from SIAD, and copeptin won't either. This shows you here patients with hypovolemic hyponatremia, big range of values, but significantly um, uh, overlapping with patients with SIAD. So neither copeptin nor AVP are necessary or helpful for a diagnosis of SIAD just continue to follow the schwartz barter criteria, but make sure that you measure and include everything that, that is part of those characteristics and criteria. So the third challenge is a more controversial one, depending upon what field you're in. And I call it avoiding the trap of cerebral salt wasting. Now, just by the fact that I used the word trap, you can probably guess what, what my opinion is about cerebral salt wasting. Uh, but let me show you that in a few slides and, and why I say it's a trap. Uh, so if you look at the studies that have looked at the prevalence of cerebral salt wasting, you can find prevalences reported from 94% to 0%. Now, you don't have to be an experienced clinician to know that any diagnosis that varies in prevalence from zero to almost 100%, there's a problem here. There must be a real problem with that diagnosis if the disparity between prevalence across multiple studies is that high. So most of those studies are retrospective uh, analyses. And, and you know, these days of evidence-based medicine, we prefer prospective studies, randomized if possible, but at least prospective if not. Uh, and so I focus on the bottom study, the one that reported 0% of, uh, of cerebral salt wasting, because it's the best study. Study out of uh, uh, Ireland, Dublin, uh, by an endocrine fellow, Mark Hannon and Chris Thompson's group. They looked at 100 consecutive patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, and they, the, the Mark studied them every day, for, visited them, studied them, measured everything he could consecutively for 12 days, 50% developed hyponatremia, which is typical for subarachnoid hemorrhage. And then he deduced the etiology. And if you look at the table, 71% had SID, 8% glucocorticoid insufficient, 10% just had incorrect IV fluids administered, 10% uh, were hypovolemic, but none meant classical criteria for cerebral salt wasting, zero. And this shows you the fluid balance of those patients, uh, of all the patients on the left, and then the individual subgroups on the right. Uh, and you can see almost all of them were not in a hypovolemic state, which is necessary for a diagnosis of cerebral salt wasting because that's what elevates the AVP in cerebral salt wasting and causes water retention. None of these were in a negative follow, maybe one or two, but basically none of them met criteria for cerebral salt wasting. Uh, and so why do this and another IRIS study uh, 
identify so fewer patients, cerebral salt wasting, they used more rigorous criteria for the diagnosis. Uh, and this goes back to the original description of cerebral salt wasting by Peters in the early 1950s. Uh, you had to have true hypovolemic hyponatremia. There had to be an excessive diuresis. There had to be a profound naturesis. And the volume contraction had to be documented prior to any elevation of plasma AVP levels. And all of those retrospective studies that reported high incidence didn't, didn't meet all these criteria. This prospective study that did which is why I believe this uh, study above all others. And why is this a trap? It's a trap because this is way overdiagnosed today in most hospitals. It's overdiagnosed because uh, uh, both neurologists and neurosurgeons tend to believe the retrospective data that showed high incidences or prevalences uh, rather than the prospective studies that don't. Uh, most of these patients have SIAD, so you should treat them as such. A few do have cerebral salt wasting. I have seen it you know, in a handful of patients. My colleagues have as well, but it's a rare disease. It's not a disease that occurs in 50 to 60% of hypovolemic, hyponatremic patients. And that's why it's a trap because some of the literature will have, would have you believe that that's the case. And that does impact on treatment of these patients as I'll show you. So the fourth challenge, make sure your initial therapy is appropriate for the patient that you're treating. You know, very often the initial therapy is the most important therapy for our patients because that uh, uh, determines a lot of their future course in the hospital. So this is an algorithm I use um, uh, to show you the various steps that are involved in diagnosis of, of hyponatremia. Uh, the first thing always is determination of the extracellular fluid volume status, which is this blue box in the middle. Uh, if I can get the pointer to respond more quickly. Uh, but up at the top, you see ECF volume status. That's important because that determines the path, the diagnostic path you take. Uh, if the patient is hypervolemic shown on the left, is hypovolemic shown on the left, you follow a different treatment path than if they're hypervolemic uh, shown on the right. Uh, and if they're euvolemic, then you have to do all the steps I've just described to document a diagnosis of SIAD. However, Whenever you see big red arrows, you know what that means. Big red arrows means you ought to pay attention to something else, which means that you always have to evaluate the neurological symptoms right at the time of admission, before you get back a lot of tests, before you even know what the patient's volume status is, you evaluate the neurological status. Why? Because this is the most feared complication of severe hyponatremia. Uh, on the left is a normal brain. On the right is a, an acute hyponatremic brain. And you can see the difference. The, the sulci have become a face, the ventricles are slits. This is cerebral edema. And when cerebral edema reaches this stage, there's no place to go because it hits the wall. The wall is the skull. Uh, and the only place to go is down. And that's when you get herniation through the tentorium and through the forama magnum, compression of respiratory centers in the brainstem. Uh, and uh, patient death. And even if the patient doesn't die of a respiratory failure, if you catch them in time and you intubate them, they will die of brain death because at this point, there's no brain perfusion with that degree of cerebral edema. So uh, the question you should be asking is how much cerebral edema does it take to go from a normal brain to a brain that's likely to herniate? And internists, endocrinologists, nephrologists probably don't really know that answer because we don't deal with it frequently. So you do what we always do. You turn your colleagues, in this case, your colleagues in neurology, you know, what is a normal brain uh, volume? And if you add up on MRIs or CTs, all of the CSF density in the brain, you will know how much room you have inside the skull for the brain to expand before uh, it, it, it can't expand anymore. And that answer for adults is 10 to 12%. So you got 10 to 10, 10 to 12% CSS space in your brain, and therefore you can tolerate 10 to 12% of cerebral edema uh, without herniation. Now that varies by age, it varies a little bit by sex. Uh, in fact, uh, it's one of the few things that get better with age because uh, older patients have more room in their brain to accommodate cerebral edema. It's one of the unappreciated benefits of senile atrophy uh, that those of us uh, of a certain age uh, can appreciate. Uh, so yes, there are variations in how much brain edema you can tolerate, but if it on average takes 10 to 12%, what's a 10 to 12% drop 
in plasma sodium or uh, serum sodium plasma osmolality. If you're starting at 140 and you decrease 11%, it gets you to 125. And in fact, 125 is where patients who have acute hyponatremia at the end of a marathon or ultra marathon typically have a serum sodium between 123 and 125. So yes, that degree of hyponatremia can kill patients if it's acute and if it's not treated appropriately. That's why you always have to ask initially, what are the neurological symptoms? And the reason it happens we know is because of osmotic movement of water into the brain. This cartoon, again, I like cartoons because they simply show you what the pathophysiology. Uh, if you develop an acute hyponatremia, the osmolality outside the brain is, high, is higher than, is lower than the osmolality inside the brain. The law of osmosis says water has to move into brain. You can't, you can't not follow the law of osmosis, so we can't do that. That results in brain edema shown in the dotted line, and if that exceeds the 8 to 10%, then the patient may die. However, the brain adapts very quickly. How does it adapt? It adapts by losing solute, sodium, potassium, osmolites. As you lose solute, you lose the water, and therefore the brain edema goes away. So I estimate right now at your hospital at UCSF, if you're like other hospitals like ours, about 15% of your patients in the hospital are hyponatremic. That's the average across the US. None of them have brain edema unless they've developed a hyponatremia in the last 48 hours because their brain has undergone this adaptation process. Question is how long does it take this process to go to completion? In both animals and in the limited studies we have in humans, it takes about two days, 48 hours. And that's why we define an acute hyponatremia as less than 48 hours because the brain has not had sufficient time to adapt and decrease the brain edema. A chronic hyponatremia is defined, again, arbitrarily, but based on the animal data we do have as uh, greater than 48 hours. And you will see how that influences uh, treatment in just a bit. However, I wanna stress one thing. The brains of those 15% of your patients in the hospital that are hyponatremic don't have brain edema, but that is not a normal brain because what it took to get from here to here is loss of up to 20% of the brain solute. And some of that solute, the osmolites or, or neurotransmitters that are important for brain function uh, will result in something I'll show you at the end. So it's not a normal brain may not have brain edema, the patient may not have serious symptoms, but there is uh, some abnormality of, of CNS function because of this adaptation process. So if you look at the symptoms of hyponatremia, they're all neurological, basically. They all affect how the low sodium and osmolality affects the brain. It starts out with mild and nonspecific symptoms, moves through confusion, delirium, disorientation, and then more severe neurological symptoms, coma, convulsions, respiratory arrest. Those symptoms are life-threatening, and usually it means it's an acute hyponatremia because there's brain edema. These symptoms, they do cause the patient to be symptomatic depending on what the symptoms are, but the patient is less impaired. Usually it means it's chronic and the brain has adapted at least to some degree to the hyponatremia. Now, you have always read in textbooks and up-to-date and other, other sources of information that uh, the acute hyponatremia should be corrected quickly and chronic should be corrected slowly, just as a th simplification of the recommendations. The problem is you usually don't know. The patient can't tell you if it's acute or chronic. Their family usually can't. Uh, and so how do you know? If you don't know, uh, then that, you can't use that criteria in determining your treatment. However, you can always do a neurological exam. You can always tell which of these symptoms are present or not. And therefore you can use the degree of neurological symptomatology as a surrogate for the duration of hyponatremia. The FDA doesn't like surrogate measures, but, but we use them because they're important. And so if uh, my fellows or residents see these symptoms here, they're gonna assume that this is an acute hyponatremia and they're gonna treat it as an acute hyponatremia, which we'll talk about shortly. And if they these, these see these symptoms, they need they don't they need they know they don't need to act as quickly, and they can use alternative therapies again, which I'll show you shortly. Uh, shortly being right now. So my algorithm for determining treatment of hyponatremia is based entirely on neurological symptoms. It's not based on the level of serum sodium. It's based on neurological symptomatology, and as usual, I divide it into three levels: severe, moderate, and mild. With severe hyponatremia, severely symptomatic hyponatremia, coma, obtundation, seizures, respiratory arrest, unexplained vomiting, the choice is easy because there's no choice. 
there's only one treatment that really you can use, which is hypertonic saline, uh, which you can then followed by other therapy because the only therapy that can be guaranteed to quickly raise your sodium by at least three to five millimoles per liter in a short period of time is hypertonic saline. You shouldn't even think about other therapies if you see a patient uh, presenting with those symptoms. Now, traditionally, we've used a chronic infusion of hypertonic saline. There are various formulas to help you decide what that infusion rate should be. They're all complicated. Uh, some of them I don't even understand myself. Uh, I use a simple formula is just multiply the uh, patient weight times the desired correction rate. And that gives you the mLs per hour of 70 mLs per hour if you wanna correct at one milligram per liter per hour. That's fine. Uh, it's just an estimate and you'll have to turn your rate up or down depending upon the plasma sodium change. However, uh, we have been uh, following um, uh, athletes and, and non-athletes uh, participating in endurance and uh, exercise events, marathons, ultra marathons, triathlons. And we see these patients uh, uh, at the end of the race in the medical tent at the finish line, sometimes prevent it, presenting with severe symptomatic hyponatremia. About 12% of patients who participate in marathons develop hyponatremia uh, by good uh, studies across multiple uh, uh, events. And in the medical tent uh, at the end of a race, it's a tent. There's a grass floor, it's a tent. I guarantee you there are no infusion pumps. So you really can't do that. We had to have an alternative method. And the method that we both developed and promoted in our publications are boluses of hypertonic saline. 100 ml bolus IV over five to 10 minutes uh, of 3% sodium chloride. You follow the serum sodium with point of care finger stick uh, sodium testing. Uh, and you repeat it until you get to goal. And that works fine for these runners in the medical tent. But most of you probably aren't hanging out at the medical tent at the end of uh, a marathon race. So why do I say this to you now? Well, I say it because we are now going over to this as the preferred method for treatment of symptomatic hyponatremia in inpatients, not only in uh, people participating in endurance events. And this shows the first study that really looked at that carefully done in Dublin, Ireland uh, by Chris Thompson's group, who I'll show you in a second. And they compared infusion, and these are all patients presenting with a severe hyponatremia, Glasgow coma score at 12 or less. Uh, and they compared the chronic infusion shown in the blue, which was 50 mLs per hour with the bolus therapy, which I showed you anywhere from one to three boluses of 100 uh, over a couple hours. And as you would predict, looking at the red lines, the boluses correct the sodium more quickly in the first six to 12 hours, they sh it should. Uh, even though by at the end of 24 hours, they all ended up at the same point. So, you know, if they all ended up at the same point, what, what's the advantage of correcting them more quickly? The advantage is shown in the right panel where you can see the sequential Glasgow coma scores. The patient who got, patients who got bolus therapy much more quickly corrected their neurological deficits than the patients who got the chronic infusion. And so for most of us, this constitutes uh, the preferred approach. If your patient is acutely symptomatic, bolus them with 100 mLs uh, every 30 to 60 minutes, making sure you follow sodium before the next bolus since you don't wanna overcorrect them and you will get a quicker neurological response. It is, I think, what we should be doing these days rather than uh, controlled infusion. So I said, this was, uh, this was done by Chris Thompson's group in, in Dublin. And I just wanted to show this slide. Chris is a good friend and colleague, uh, but he remembers very well the time he spent at UCF UCSF as a visiting professor in Dr. Ganang's uh, Department of Physiology. Uh, he also is, as you can tell from this picture, an avid uh, athlete, uh, and he played for the San Francisco Celtics. So I told Chris I would show this slide uh, so that he could be here in absentia, even though he can't be here in person. So this was also confirmed in a larger study uh, done in Korea, salsa RCT. They compared bolus shown in green with continuous infusion shown in yellow. Same results, quicker correction with the boluses, but no real differences long-term in the correction. But one thing was brought out by this study. They used a larger bolus, they used 150 mLs because the European guidelines recommended that. They had a much larger percentage over correction using the larger bolus uh, from 47, 41% to 57% uh, of patients 
uh, required lowering of the, of the serum sodium because they correct it too much. And so uh, I would not use the larger bolus. We still recommend 100 mLs, uh, again, only uh, repeating if the repeat serum sodium uh, doesn't uh, reach the level that your goal is. And we'll talk about what the goal should be shortly. Then you have the patients with moderate symptoms, altered mental status, disorientation, confusion, unexplained nausea, and gait instability. Those are symptoms, they're neurological symptoms, and I believe those patients should be treated promptly, but not necessarily as quickly as the patient with severe symptoms, so you have time to decide the most appropriate therapy. The most appropriate therapy depends on their volume status. Hypovolemic, solute repletion with isotonic saline, Euvolemic, vasopressin antagonist, limited hypertonic saline or urea followed by fluid restriction. Hypervolemic, usually heart failure, less often um, a cirrhosis. Avaptin is preferred in my opinion because the hepatologist, cardiologist really wouldn't like you giving them hypertonic saline and worsening their ECF volume expansion. So uh, if we look at success rates, so one of the things in medicine you ought to always try to do is employ therapies that really do what you want them to do. So if you're employing a therapy for hyponatremia, you want to be sure it actually works to treat the hyponatremia because otherwise you're just wasting time with that therapy, right? So we want to do that for all therapies. So in our registry, uh, we looked again retrospectively uh, at patients who were treated with SIDH by clinical diagnosis, treated with a variety of methods, and then we looked at success of the treatment. Well, how do you define the success? We had three measures. At minimal success, you increased your sodium by at least five millimoles per liter. Better, you got to over 130 millimoles per liter. Best, you normalized the serum sodium. If we just look at the, at the uh, most uh, liberal therapy, at least increase the sodium by five. Fluid restriction, successful 44% of the time. No better than no treatment at all. This was probably just a spontaneous resolution of the hyponatremia. Normal saline, even less, because you wouldn't expect normal saline to work in these patients. In fact, we were surprised that 36% did work or responded. Best was the AVP antagonist, Hovaptin, at 78%, or 3% saline at 60%. So if you really need to correct the sodium and you need to do it in a limited period of time, use therapies that are effective. And our most effective therapies or tovaptin as an AVP antagonist and a hypertonic saline. If you want to normalize it, really only uh, the AVP antagonist had a, had a uh, significantly greater uh, success rate at that. Urea is not shown here because at this time we did this study, urea wasn't used sufficiently in hospitals to get a large enough number to, to analyze. AVP antagonist, of course, worked by blocking the AVP B2 receptor in the kidney that blocks this whole uh, signal transduction process, uh, resulting in excretion of free water rather than reabsorption of free water, which we call antidiuresis. And you might say this creates a diuresis, but we've classically defined diuresis as increased excretion of urine with both electrolytes, i.e. sodium uh, and water, whereas these agents cause selective water excretion we'd prefer to call that anachoresis. There is no stimulation of natriuresis or increased sodium excretion with the vasopressin antagonist. And they clearly do work. This is the uh, phase three study uh, that gained approval for tovaptin. You can see patients starting at lower than 130, uh, solid circles tovaptin, correction to normal within four days, maintenance over 30 days compared to placebo shown in the open circles. But when the drug was stopped after 30 days, uh, the sodium fell right back down to lower levels, proving that this therapy, you know, worked over long periods of time. And in the subsequent open label study reported by Tom Burrell, uh, patients were followed out to four years. They maintained the normonatremia until the drug was stopped, in which case they became hyponatremia again. So a very good drug. There are problems with using it, both in terms of cost and availability, but when you can use it, it really does the job that uh, it's supposed to do. It has great efficacy, and I would argue from our experience, uh, uh, safety as well. Because of the high cost of tovaptin, a lot of people are now turning to urea as a treatment, uh, and it is effective. I've been using it since I was a fellow, uh, selectively in cases. 
So I have a pretty long experience with using urea. And as summarized in, in this uh, cartoon by Rick Stearns, remember that urea only works once it's excreted by the kidney. Uh, it causes an osmotic diuresis. And you should know because your nephrology uh, attendings uh, have taught you that when you get a solute diuresis, you excrete water with the excess solute. That's why patients with uncontrolled hyperglycemia uh, and glucosuria become dehydrated uh, uh, quickly because that solute diuresis causes water excretion as, as well as glucose excretion. Urea does the same thing. And basically when you give 30 grams of urea to a patient, these are not milligrams, these are grams. So you, you can hold that amount in your hand uh, was one of the problems with taking it. It tastes terrible. Um, and so if you, 30 grams of urea will cause a patient on average to excrete an excess of one liter of water. And again, that will help to correct the hyponatremia. Usually that's enough. Sometimes you have to go to 60 grams uh, of urea to do it. So it's good. It's a good alternative therapy especially for outpatients when you can't use a vasopressin antagonist for a variety of reasons. Now, I know that many of you, particularly residents uh, uh, attending this conference, either here or virtually, use salt tablets. I mean, every resident in the country uses salt tablets to treat hyponatremia, except at my institution, where maybe only 60% do, because I made a little bit of an impact uh, there. So the question is, do salt tablets help to treat hyponatremia? Yes, they do. But the only way they do with SIAD is by causing a solute diuresis. In other words, you have to be excreting enough sodium in the urine to carry water with it. You have to create an osmotic diuresis. Otherwise, salt tablets will not work because SIAD patients are not sodium deficient. So how much salt does it take to create an osmotic diuresis? I already showed you 30 grams of urea does it. And that is 50 milliosms in terms of the osmotic content of urea. Sodium chloride tabs, one gram is 34 milliosmoles. So how many sodium chloride tabs does it take to equal 30 grams of urea? That's a pretty simple cal calculation. You, know, you divide 30, 500 by 34, it takes 15 grams of sodium chloride. I'm pretty sure no one in this room or the audience treats hyponatremia with 15 grams of sodium chloride. That's not a safe amount of sodium chloride to give the patients. Typical treatment those one gram TID. That's pretty ineffective uh, for any treatment. So yes, salt tablets can work, but you have to use a much larger amount than typically is used for treatment of these patients. And therefore I will tell you in the audience, as I tell my residents, you know, supplementing with less than six to nine grams a day of sodium chloride is, is gonna be uh, ineffectual and, and uh, you're treating yourself when you think you're treating the patient with that amount of salt tabs. New player on the blocks, a Swiss group is described using the STL2 TL2 inhibitor epi, epigliflozin uh, to treat hyponatremia. And you might think it, it should work because epigliflozin works by increasing urinary glucose excretion. That's a solute, it'll cause a solute diuresis. And in their studies, it does work but if you look at the treatment effect between epigliflozin uh, and placebo, it's very uh, minimal. So this will cause maybe at most a three to four, maybe five millimole per liter increase in your serum sodium, not much more than that. So if that's all you need and you want to employ something to do it, that's not tovaptin or urea, uh, you can try this. I, I've used it, it does work. But again, it's a limited amount of correction of the uh, serum sodium. Finally, what about these patients? That's the bulk of patients that you see both as outpatients and in the hospital. No or minimal symptoms despite hyponatremia. The symptoms they have are so nonspecific, you don't even know if they're from the hyponatremia itself. What do you do with those patients? Well, our first line therapy has always been fluid restriction. Uh, and that's appropriate because some patients do respond to fluid restriction. So I'm not arguing against using fluid restriction, but that you should use it intelligently when you do use it as you do should do for any therapy. And using it intelligently means you know how to use it. We've shown at the top part of this table, make sure you're restricting all fluids, not just water. Seems simple, but, but patients don't always realize that. But more importantly, know that we do have predictors of failure of fluid restriction. Uh, we have four of them. Uh, one is a high urine osmolality because the higher the urine osmolality, the less free water excretion in the urine, the more difficult it is to put the patient in a negative water balance. Second, you don't, uh, most people aren't familiar with, 
that if you uh, add up the urine sodium and potassium, and that exceeds the serum sodium, I'll show you that in a second, that predicts failure of uh, correction because what you need to correct the sodium is not just a negative osmotic uh, water balance. You need a negative uh, sodium free uh, uh, water excretion. Uh, and, and if your urine sodium and potassium are very high, you're not gonna have that. And finally, if your urine volume is less than 1500, you're probably not gonna succeed. It's very difficult to maintain a chronic fluid restriction in patients uh, that is uh, significantly less than 1500 mLs per day. So this is the first equation that, that describes that ratio of urine uh, to plasma electrolytes. Again, urine sodium plus potassium over serum sodium. If it's greater than one, the amount of fluid restriction required will be zero. I think you know it's pretty tough to maintain a fluid restriction of zero in any patient. So your patient will fail a fluid restriction. Even if it's 0.5 to one, the fluid restriction has to be pretty severe, 500, maybe 800 mLs per 24 hours. Again, difficult to maintain chronically. Only if it's less than five can you get away with less than a, a liter, a typical 1.2 liter per day fluid restriction. That explains the data I showed you why fluid restriction is successful in less than 50% of patients, because many of them have the urine to plasma electrolyte ratio that would predict failure fluid restriction right from the start. And therefore it's doomed to failure, uh, uh, at least in many patients, uh, even before beginning. You know, that being said, we've been using fluid restriction for over 50 years since the original description by Schwartz and Barter. And for 50 years of a therapy that's employed in thousands of patients over many years, there has never been a randomized control trial of the efficacy of fluid restriction, never over 50 years in, in a therapy that we use every day. Until recently when the Irish group, again, Chris Thompson's group, did this study, a randomized control a trial of fluid restriction to 1,000 mLs per day versus no therapy. Patients on fluid restriction shown on red, no therapy shown on blue, it did work. So you can see by the red line that there was an increase in serum sodium compared to no therapy. How much was that? Average of three millimoles per liter. Uh, and it didn't increase over 30 days of maintained fluid restriction. So what you see in the first couple of days with fluid restriction is what you're gonna get. Uh, and on average, it'll be less than five millimoles per liter. Conclusion, fluid restriction works, but it, is limited and it is a moderate degree of sodium correction. If that's all you need, it's a fine therapy. Uh, but if you need more than that, it's probably not gonna do the job. And what about if you add salt tablets to fluid restriction? That was looked at in a study in Thailand uh, shown here, uh, three groups. The, the black group had fluid restriction alone. The, the, the light gray had fluid restriction plus furosemide and the darker gray had fluid restriction plus furosemide plus salt tablets. And the median increase in serum sodium was five millimoles per liter, but the addition of furosemide and salt tablets had no beneficial effect over the fluid restriction itself. So again, you wanna use salt tablets, you know, one to three grams a day, go ahead, it's gonna be harmless, but you're not gonna have any significant effect on the hyponatremia. So yes, start out with a fluid restriction, but consider pharmacological therapy if the patient can tolerate a fluid restriction, which will be frequent, uh, or there's a predicted failure of fluid restriction by the criteria that I just showed you. All right, let's move on uh, to one of the uh, not final, but close to final um, challenges, which is uh, uh, avoiding osmotic demyelination. Um, and actually, I think we're gonna run out of time, so I'm gonna go quickly. So obviously this is one of the concerns about correction osmotic demyelination from overly rapid correction. You want to avoid that. We have criteria to avoid that, and that's shown in this table. If this is a less than 48 hour uh, hyponatremia, there is no maximum limit to how much you can correct the hyponatremia. At the finish line of marathons, we don't stop the correction once it reaches eight or 10 or 12. We just let them correct all the way to normal. There's no risk of osmotic demyelination. In most of your patients, there is some risk, so we recommend correcting no more than 10 to 12 in 24 hours. Uh, and the goal actually should be lower of around four to eight to guarantee that you don't exceed the limit. If you do exceed it, should you lower the sodium uh, to that limit? Uh, we don't think it's necessary. The data isn't very clear, 
it's optional, but in general, it's a good idea. This is the problem group, high risk of osmotic demyelination. Those are patients who are at high risk to demyelinate with overcorrection or overly rapid correction, no more than eight millimole per liter correction in any 24 hour period. And the goal should be less four to six. And if you do accidentally overcorrect, you have to bring the sodium back down, uh, either via free water as D5W, uh, with or without desmopressin, to minimize the risk of osmotic demyelination. Now, that being said, we all fear that. These are the risk factors for ODS. Very low sodium, less than 105. Any degree of hypokalemia, alcoholism, malnutrition, advanced liver disease. You see any of these, you should follow the more conservative criteria of no more than eight and 24 hours. That being said, how often does this feared consequence really occur? And the answer is not really very often. So in this study from uh, Geisinger and a group in Pennsylvania, they retrospectively looked at almost 1500 patients, serum sodium less than 120. They looked at the rate of correction and they looked at the development of, of osmotic demyelination. 41% corrected more than eight millimoles per liter in 24 hours. Uh, only eight or 0.5% develop osmotic demyelination. So you will see, and you will produce overly rapid correction frequently, but only rarely will you see osmotic demyelination. Who you would see it in, that's summarized here. Five with hypokalemia, five with beer panomania, i.e. alcoholism, and most of them uh, with a serum correction over eight. So pay attention to those risk factors for osmotic demyelination. Those are the people you need to be worried about. The average hyponatremic patient without those risk factors, you know, 10 to 12, sometimes you get up to 14 to 15, likelihood of ODS is very small. One slide on this, don't perseverate using failed therapies. And we do that all the time. A typical endocrine consult at my hospital for hyponatremia, this patient has been on fluid restriction for five days, not responding, what do we do next? You don't need five days to say a patient's gonna fail. And so my last criteria for failure is your increase in serum sodium is less than two in 24 to 48 hours on a fluid restriction of less than one, one or less today. If that occurs, don't keep on using fluid restriction. You're not gonna succeed and you're not gonna do any better than that switch to something that does work. Perseveration is almost never good, and it's not good in medicine either if your therapy is not working. And this will tell you if the therapy is gonna work or not. And my final group of slides, and I will go quickly, consider something we don't often consider, long-term effects of chronic hyponatremia. We ignore chronic hyponatremia because we think there are no neurological symptoms, patient seems fine, why do we need to treat the hyponatremia? So in multiple international studies, this has been found. Low serum sodium levels, this is a study out of Cork, Ireland, have an increased odds ratio for what? Of increased fragility fractures. No other serum sodium is associated with that significant risk. Many independent international studies, now over 15, have confirmed this association. There's no question, hyponatremia is associated with increased fracture risk in every study that's ever looked at it. The questions are, why does it occur? What mechanisms? And there are two. One is in the brain. Hyponatremia causes gait instability, an unstable gait, increased falls. And obviously, if an old patient falls more, they're going to fracture more. But the second is not well known. Hyponatremia affects bone. It causes bone loss and osteoporosis. And we first showed this in a translational animal study shown in my lab. Uh, these are the femurs from uh, two rats, uh, inhabitants of my lab uh, at one point. And the one on your left is normal sodium, normal natremic reactive. One on the right, we induced hyponatremia to 150 millimoles per liter for how long? Three months. That's a rat. So you will ask, well, should we care about that in humans? So we turned to epidemiology at Georgetown. Uh, our um, EHR database at that time at 2.9 million in independent electronic health records. We looked at all the things associated with osteoporosis, and indeed many of them like uh, uh, steroid use, uh, shown somewhere down here, anti-seizure drugs, had an increased odds ratio for osteoporosis. But what's at the top, what's at the very top at an odds ratio of 3.987 is chronic hyponatremia. As we defined it as hyponatremia, that uh, two levels of hyponatremic levels at, at at least one year apart, significant odds ratio uh, for osteoporosis. And if this were associated with fractures, was it? Yes, it was. 
recent hyponatremia, I mean hyponatremia 30 days before the fracture, also had an odds ratio of over three uh, uh, with uh, uh, hyponatremia. So we're very confident that this is a phenomenon both in humans, uh, human patients, uh, not just rats in my lab. So finally, I wanna talk and close with uh, a view of evidence-based medicine. It's not a negative view, it's a, it's a view of the limitations of evidence-based medicine. No one is gonna argue against evidence-based medicine. That's our gold standard for well, how we should be treating patients, but it doesn't always give us the answers we want. So I'm gonna give you four examples of evidence. The Japanese eat a low-fat diet, have a lower rate of cardiovascular disease than the English and the Americans. That's an that's a, a epidemiological fact. The French eat a high fat diet for sure and have lower rates of cardiovascular disease than the English and Americans. And that also has been proven by a variety of studies. The Chinese drink little alcohol because of alcohol intolerance uh, and they have lower rates of cardiovascular disease than the English and the Americans. And finally, the Italians drink a lot of alcohol. We know that, we don't need a study to show us that and have lower rates of cardiovascular disease than the English and Americans. So those are your facts, that's the evidence. What are you gonna conclude if that's your evidence database? Well, there's not a lot that you can include, but there are, I'll conclude, but there are two things. Eat and drink whatever you want because it doesn't seem to make a difference with regard to cardiovascular disease. But what does make a difference from the data I showed you is speaking English that really kills you because that's the only group that had the increased cardiovascular mortality. So with tongue in cheek, it illustrates an important point that evidence-based data is dependent on whether you really have a complete evidence database to really make firm conclusions. And if you don't, you may make absurd conclusions like is shown in this, uh, in this uh, example. And I would say that up to now, including now, we have not had a good enough evidence database for the chronic effects of hyponatremia to say, it's not causing a problem. We don't need to worry about it and you don't need to treat it. We don't have that evidence. And therefore I don't think we can really effectively practice uh, evidence-based medicine for the treatment of chronic hyponatremia. We need more data, we need more studies and hopefully you know, maybe some of you will do those studies. So everything I told you is available in our guidelines published in 2013. Uh, it's still relevant because the field hasn't changed that much in 10 years freely downloadable from the American Journal of Medicine. Uh, and if you really want to know about any aspect of hyponatremia treatment, uh, there are many good um, review articles uh, uh, available, uh, but this one really goes into everything in terms of, of treatment of different hyponatremic states. So I'll close there. Uh, I think I've gone a little bit over, but I hope there's time for questions. Um, and again, I thank you very much. Uh, even though the weather is nicer in, in Washington, as I show you here, San Francisco is just a beautiful city. So it's always a pleasure to be here. Thanks again. Thanks again, Dr. Vervalis. That was a fantastic talk and we really appreciate it. We have a talk from the audience member, Dr. Sue. That was a really masterful. Could you comment on why hypokalemia is a risk factor ah. for us? Okay, yeah, yeah, so, so yes, I can. So you know, as a nephrologist, you know that, that by the time you actually see hypokalemia in the plasma, that doesn't occur until intracellular potassium is severely depleted, you know, because the intracellular potassium, the excess of potassium from cells buffers the plasma potassium. So, you know, you can have substantial degrees of intracellular potassium depletion, yet a normal serum potassium. You know, that, that happens a lot in DKA where the, where the potassium looks normal, but as, as you treat the DKA, you know, the potassium drops to, to lower levels because you've lost that intracellular buffering uh, that occurs. So how does that make cells uh, in, in this case, brain cells more susceptible to damage and demyelination is because the demyelination is caused by a shrinkage of the brain as the osmolality increases. And the brain cells that are solute deficient will shrink more because they've lost some of their intracellular buffering capacity because of the potassium loss from those cells. And so we showed in a study in my lab compared to a study in a colleague's lab 
that if you take hyponatremic animals, this doesn't have to do with uh, uh, hypokalemia directly, but if you take hyponatremic animals who have lost intracellular solute, as I showed you, and you raise the osmolality, their brain will shrink faster than animals who are normonatremic that you raise the osmolality to the same degree. Loss of intracellular solute puts brain cells at risk for greater dehydration, and that is a risk factor for demyelination if those cells are supporting the myelin sheaths. So in fact, I think hypokalemia is one of the biggest risk factors. As I showed you, other than alcoholism, it is the biggest risk factor for uh, creation of uh, osmotic demyelination. So I would, I would pay careful attention to the potassium value. We're a little bit over time, but we do have one question from the audience, from the Zoom audience, and that is, you know, the wellness influencers and all those people are telling you, drink eight to 12 cups a day. This is in the media or more. And then there's also a lot of mixed evidence about soda, sparkling water, diet Coke, et cetera. What would be your, your retort to all these wellness magazines trying to make you drink 12 cups of water? So I will refer you to a piece uh, that I wrote for the Washington Post about two months ago in response to a weekly column of, of readers' questions about health issues, uh, in which the question was, how much I, should I drink a day? Um, and so um, I can send that to, uh, to you and your colleagues uh, because it summarizes my opinions of that. And the opinion of those of us uh, that have studied both fluid intake and fluid excretion is it's only necessary to drink the thirst, that there's never been a proven health benefit of drinking over what you need to not be thirsty, except in one group of patients. And that group of patients are patients with kidney stones, because clearly in those patients, maintaining a more dilute urine is helpful to prevent precipitation and more kidney stones. But if you look at any other group in terms of, is there a health benefit to drinking more, maintaining a quote, better uh, level of hydration, unquote, there is no real evidence. Some recent epidemiological evidence uh, or studies um, would claim that there is, but, but until I see a, an actual intervention study that shows health benefit, uh, I don't think you need to drink more than to, to uh, alleviate your thirst. The patients, they're, they're, we, we try to keep them from being patients. The runners that, that develop hyponatremia during marathons, ultramarathons, triathlons, clearly have excess water retention because of excess drinking. And it doesn't matter whether it's water, Gatorade, or any other sports drink, there's still mostly water. And if you have an elevated ABP level, you're gonna retain the water uh, and it's gonna drop your sodium level. So the advice that we have given to runners, uh, athletes, actually most of them are non-athletes, they're just running a marathon, um, uh, is you only need to drink when you're thirsty. You don't need to force yourself to drink. Uh, it's the people who force themselves to drink that get into trouble and occasionally have died because of hyponatremia uh, developing during and after the marathon. So my advice is when you're thirsty, drink. Obviously, when you're eating food, which is when most of our water uh, fluid ingestion occurs, you know, drink whatever makes you comfortable and and uh, satisfies you to, to drink with your food. You don't need to restrict water. No normal individual needs to restrict water, but you don't need to over drink either. And that's where I would, I would take issue with whoever, whether it's a wellness magazine or, or um, uh, people who work for the water industry, <laughs> who, who obviously wanted to drink more for uh, their financial benefit, uh, which is an, an important conflict of interest that you know, we have uh, pushed to make sure that people identify those conflicts. You know, it, it's, it, it's not just consulting for a drug company, you know, if you consult for a water beverage company, well, and, and then you recommend more fluid intake, well, that's just as big a conflict of interest and it has to be reported. So drink to your thirst. And if you, if you wish, drink more, but not a lot more. Average fluid intake of the Western adult, and this has been studied as 2.4 liters a day. That's the average. Uh, obviously, variance is huge because people vary a lot in how much they drink, but that's the average. And I would say no one drinks needs to drink more than about 3.5 liters a day. Uh, 
Well, thank you so much. What an educational lecture. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me.